Hi there, <clears throat> and uh, welcome to this presentation. Um, for the next five, 50 minutes or so, we're going to talk about something new in Spring 5. Oh, there's Simon. Maybe Simon can give me his, his uh, adapter thingy, pointer thingy. Yeah, would be nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I said, wait for the next 50 minutes or so, there we can talk about the functional web framework in uh, Spring 5. So first, a little bit about me. I'm Arjen Poutsma. Some of you might have heard my, read my name somewhere on the uh, Java doc or something. Um, I joined Spring Source in 2005, more or less. Uh, so it's been 12 years for now. Uh, did Spring Web Services, so that's SOAP-based services. And uh, Spring MVC I did as well, a little bit, specifically the REST part that were introduced in Spring uh, 3, specifically. Uh, I did Spring Scala, a project you might have heard about. And nowadays, well, for the past two and a half years or so, I've been mainly working on Spring Reactive, um, so the reactive efforts that you probably heard about a lot. So before we get started, I want to know a little bit, get a little bit of an insight into um, have you, if you people already looked at this new framework or is it completely new to you? So who has already played a little bit with this functional web framework? All right. Okay. So I guess an introduction it is. <laughs> Only three people. So we'll do an introduction. So before we get started, I'm going to say a lot of bad things about annotations right now. And before we do that, I just want to make very clear that I actually like annotations as well. So this is sort of a slide to say where I'm coming from. I was one of the people involved with coming up with the initial controller. And, but it also, I think, gives me a little bit of credit to talk about the downside of annotations and why we think that functional processing or functional programming, in a way, uh, offers an alternative that might solve some of these problems that you have. And if you don't have those problems, then there's nothing wrong with using annotations, right? This is just a choice. But there are downsides to annotations, right? One thing that bothers a lot of people, myself included sometimes, is the magicness of it all, right? You annotate something and something happens. Um, if you're happy with that default behavior, then it's perfectly fine. Your world is perfect. However, if you want to change that behavior, then there's a bit of a downside if you're dealing with annotations. Because in Java, annotations have no behavior, right? It's only data. And you cannot extend from it. You cannot override any behavior. The only option you have, basically, and the only option that we provide in Spring is for us to provide some sort of strategy interfaces through which you can uh, add support for your own annotations or uh, customize the default behavior that we, we do with the annotations, right? But the data, so you have the data on one side, you have the, 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 the annotation data, and then you have the behavior that interprets the data, and these things are completely separate, right? In, 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 in Spring or any kind of annotation processing code base. Because once again, annotations don't have any behavior. So what that means for you as users is that there's no real clear link between the behavior and the data, right? So if you want to debug uh, the way annotations are interpreted, for instance, then you really have to know how a little bit more about Spring, how Spring works internally. It's not as simple as putting a breakpoint on the annotation or something like simple as that and just stepping in and see what happens. That's not possible, right? Another thing is that if you're dealing with annotations, and specifically runtime annotations, which are by far the, the ones we use most in Spring, is that you have no choice but to deal with reflection. Right? You have to use reflection in order to find annotations on a class on a, or any type of method. Or, um, and that has a, uh, a performance downside. Right? Even though reflection these days is fast, it's not as fast as non-reflective code. Right? There's no surprise there. Uh, but it also has, and that's probably more of a problem for us than you per se, is runtime type erasure, right? Any kind of reflection you do doesn't carry the code that you provide, doesn't really have as much uh, generics available as you typically have in a compilation stage. So there are some downsides there as well. But I think the most important downside to annotations is, once again, the magicness of it all. So when we started this, this was already this project, the fun functional web framework was well, we, we decided we wanted to do something similar to that back when we started the whole reactive effort. And we basically had two ideas for web framework. The one uh, you already saw a lot of it today, right? The controller, the annotation-based one. We uh, had a code name for that internally called, it was called uh, um, Kirk, I think. 
can't remember anymore. I think it was Kirk, right? The Star Trek Kirk, because it was a bit. And then we had the functional approach that we wanted to do, and we called, decided to call that uh, uh, Spock, right? So you have Kirk, a bit more flashy annotation style, and you have the logical, crunchy style, which we called Spock. So this was a long time coming. That's what I'm trying to say. And we basically wanted to do something with the new APIs that are offered in, uh, in Java 8, right? Java Util Function, Java Util Stream. I'm sure you've already looked, took, taken a look at those or played a little bit around with those. And I really think it's interesting that they offer a, a new way of programming within a JVM, right? A new functional, almost purely functional way of doing it. So that was one goal. Another goal we had was saying, OK, we have a lot of feedback these days with uh, our internal uh, uh, Pivotal Labs guys, right? The, the guys who do consulting for us. And one of them, or a couple of them, had a little bit of a, a complaint about this magicness that I talked about earlier, right? Saying it's very hard to determine for us where a particular piece of behavior comes from, right? And how we can override it and, and how we can change it. Um, so that was another design goal, right? Saying, OK, maybe we should try to make this more like a library, where you pick the pieces that you want and, and, and combine them in a way that's specific for your application, and maybe less of a framework where you have a particular model and you, you uh, um, basically assume that the framework provides whatever you need. So that also means that you have to be a bit more explicit. So this framework is a bit more explicit than the annotation-based one. It also means, though, that it's a lot more customizable. It's very easy to override something, very easy to see where a particular piece of behavior is coming from, um, and to put in your own behavior as well. Another goal, well, not really a goal, but it was sort of a side effect of what we used to say, OK, it would be nice to see if we can do without reflection. right? I have nothing against reflection, but like I said, there is a slight performance downside there. So let's see if we can do without it. So I want to talk a little bit about functional programming in Java 8. Right? I, there's a, I don't want to talk about purely functional programming as the way it's taught in university. I want to have a very pragmatic approach to functional programming within the scopes of Java 8. And what that means? Well, it means a couple of things, talking about functional programming. Uh, one thing, very important, is immutability. Right? So basically, you construct a class or a type of some sort, and then you change it afterwards. Why do you do that? Well. Uh, asynchronous programming would be a very important reason to do that, right? Mutable data structures are very hard to deal with if you're having multiple threads, right? dealing with multiple threads. Then you have to do locks or you have to do atomic references or all kinds of synchronization. If you just make sure that the type, a particular class, um, cannot change, then you don't have to worry for that anymore, about that anymore, right? But if you talk about immutability, you also have, you, you're typically talking about builders as well, right? You, do, you have builders to build something, and then once you build it, it's, state, it's, uh, it's fixed. It's, you cannot lo longer change it. So for instance, in the JDK itself, then you have uh, the string. It's a very good example of something that's immutable, right? The string is immutable. If you call a method on it like to uppercase, then that won't change the internal string to uppercase. It will return a new string, which contains the same string in same characters in uppercase uh, uh, variant. And if you want to have a mutable string, of course, the string builder is there, or string buffer, um, if you're old fashioned. So immutability, right? Second thing, first, uh, very important when dealing, when doing functional programming is first class functions, right? You treat functions as first class citizens within your framework, within your library. So that means taking functions as arguments right, to your methods so that you can customize behavior. It may also mean that you can return functions. And the idea being that you can reuse those functions. So once again, I have an example here which is based on string. Right? Everybody knows, or probably everybody knows, the method index of car. Now you can say, well, what's the index of a particular, this particular character within the string? And that's very nice. It has been with us for since GDK 1.0. Um, would it be nice, though, given the whole Java 8, uh, uh, given Java 8 these days, would it be nice if we had a bit more flexibility there, right? So now, with index of car, you can only find a particular character. You cannot say, for instance, find me the first uppercase letter in this string. That's not possible, because you can only say, find me the first capital A or find me the first capital B. If, however, string would have had that second method that's listed there below, index of predicate car, a predicate is a, a very simmer, simple function that was introduced in, uh, in, in Java 8. It's basically tests for a particular Boolean construction, if it's true or false. 
So imagine that we would have had a predicate of car, then you could say, find me the first character that's uppercase, or find me the first not numeric character within this string, right? That's the sort of reusability or flexibility that I'm talking about here. Functions basically allow you to do more, but the, um, the end result is still the same, right? The, 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 the performance and everything is still the same. You're still iterating over the, over the string, you just have more flexibility. So first class functions, important. Pure functions, also quite important, right? Pure functions in functional programming mean something to the effect of if you give a function the same arguments, then it should yield the same result. You should also try to limit, right? ideally, no side effects, but an application without any side effect is not really a useful application. The only thing you'll notice is that it's your CPU is getting warmer, your computer is getting warmer. But any kind of other side effect, and I'm talking about printing something to the screen or writing something to a socket, right? it means also, of course, uh, displaying a web page. All those, in a traditional functional programming sense, are considered side effects. And within functional programming, you try to limit those side effects and also put them on the boundaries of your system, in a way. So you can imagine a chain of functions, each function doing something with the arguments that it gives, is given, and then returning something. That return value is picked up by another function and does something with it again and again and again. So you have a whole chain. And at some point, you have a result to say, OK, now I have what I need. Let's write this to the socket. Right? Let's build a web page out of this or whatever. Um, <clears throat> if you use pure functions, you'll find that these are a lot more easier testable. So because uh, you won't change any of the arguments, the only thing you have to do is provide new test variables for the argument and then in, uh, do an expectation on the return value. Imagine, for instance, um, a function that returns void, right? a method that returns void. That's by definition not a pure function because it doesn't return anything. It must change one of the arguments or do nothing at all. It's sort of an event sync in a way. Um, those are very hard to test, right? Think about, for instance, the servlet world, right? The traditional servlet has a, uh, the servlet has, takes two arguments, the servlet request, servlet response, and a returns void. Um, if you want to test that servlet or any kind of similar method or class that has a similar contract, you would need to create some sort of mock uh, servlet response, right? That's how you typically test these servlets. You provide a mock and then you later you verify whether the mock that you provided as an argument actually contains the real value. Well, it's a lot easier just to pass on real values and get something in return which you can best uh, test it again. Catchability, parallelization, I'm going to go into Nando's, but those are also benefits of having pure functions. Now, where does this all fit in, right, the whole functional web framework? If you consider this picture, this is basically what we do these days. And now I can actually see if I can use this smart pointing device without crashing my computer, preferably. How do I do the light thing? Huh? Ah, there we go. All right, thank you. Um, so this is the traditional stack, right? This is the whatever what we've been doing since Spring 1.0, server development C, and then on top of that we have add controller, add request mapping, all the annotations that you know and love. Now in Spring 5, obviously we have reactive HTTP. That's a layer which runs on top of Server 3.1, uh, our reactor Netty and Undertow. On top of that, we have Spring Web Reactive, which is sort of our, uh, yeah, you could compare it to this site. And on top of that, basically, we now have two programming models. So you can see that these router functions that I'm going to talk about in a minute basically sit, sit on the same infrastructure that you're getting if you're using the annotations. So you just set comparable results, basically, but just a different way of exposing it. And like Andy has said this morning, choice has always been very important to us, right? If you have been a long time Spring user, uh, you might remember that back in the day, we also had an inheritance-based controller uh, mechanism, right? The abstract form controller and simple form controller it wasn't really that simple at all. Um, but apparently, Jürgen said, validate that name because it was meant for simple forms. It was, not meant for, it was not meant to be a simple class. So those, that framework, that, that abstract form controller and the, the, the inheritance-based uh, controller framework, um, 
has, we had that side by side for a while together with the annotation based. And after a while, we dropped it because nobody is using it anymore. But I just wanted to say here, make it very clear that having different web frameworks in Spring is nothing new. We've been having that uh, for a long time now. And it also doesn't mean that we are going to deprecate or move away from the annotation based stuff. Hopefully, by the end of the presentation, you'll see why this framework is useful, what different uh, approach it takes. And if that applies to your application, if that applies to the thing you're working on, then use it. If you don't see any real temptation to use it, then by all means, stick to using annotations, right? It's about choice. So what it's all about. <clears throat> this is essentially what it is about. Within the framework, within the web framework, we define a couple of interf key interfaces, uh, functions, that you will implement. Uh, the, important, the most important one being handler function. So as you can see right here, handler function is a functional interface, right? And um, it basically takes a server response, or sorry, it takes a request, and it returns a mono of a server response. Here's another way to look at that, but then in terms of a, of a normal Java util function, basically. But those two things come down to the same thing. So this is the contract you're dealing with. This is the, basically, this is comparable to a controller method in an ad controller, so your request mapping method. That's basically what this is. So this, will, this function will typically look at the request, maybe take out some stuff, right, if it's a post or a, a, some sort of form submittal or something else, take something out of the request, <clears throat> and then uh, write a response. And you also see <clears throat> that this um, interface is purely functional in the sense that it doesn't take both request and response as arguments and returns void. Rather, it returns a response object. And later, you'll see how you can use that when we're talking about filters, right? You can have a whole filter chain where each filter takes the response that was provided by a previous filter and then adapts it, et cetera. But for now, just know that you're getting a request, you have to return a response. Oh, it works too. Um, so this server request that I showed here is basically very similar to request entity. It's immutable. I hope I explained why we did that, but it's a request coming in. You cannot change it. You cannot add headers. You cannot do anything. You can, however, build a new request. Right? Reasons for those will be come apparent later, but know that it's possible to create a new request based on an existing request and just overwrite particular headers, et cetera. Um, one big difference with request entity and why we, in fact, decided to create a new type for this is that it's completely Java 8 based, right? So rather than returning uh, null for a non-existent value, such as a content type, right? Imagine a request without a content type. These days, or within server request, we actually return an optional, right? I know, hope that everybody has at least seen optional and dealt with it. Right? Basically, the idea of optional is that you can map based on the return value instead of checking it for null, et cetera. Um, so yeah, headers, access, content type, but also getting access to a list of them, et cetera. The body, um, you can convert to a reactor type, right? So a mono in this case. You can say, convert this mono into, oh, sorry, convert the body into a string or a POJO, right? my own person class. I'll be showing that later in a demo. Um, and then um, you can also turn it into a flux and all kinds of other types. Response, same way, uh, similar to response entity. It's also immutable, but you have a builder. So you typically use the builder to build the response. Um, you can, it's also Java 8, right? We have support for zone date time in there just because um, that's a heck of a lot better than Java Util Date. Um, we have header access, and you can also provide your body, once again, through a publisher. Um, you can see here that you can provide a body as a publisher, that be it a mono or a flux, or maybe even an Rx Java uh, reactive type. That's all fine. You do, however, have to specify the type. The reasons for that will come later, but basically know that um, because this is a stream, Right? We cannot simply inspect the publisher to see what kind of elements are contained in it. Right? And once again, because of runtime type erasure, we don't really know the type T that's provided here. Right? That's not ready for us uh, at runtime. So specifying the class basically allows us to know upfront 
what kind of data is coming. So it's, oh, this is a person object, so let's get ready the JSON, uh, JSON marshaller for this particular person class. That's why you have to provide the class there. So first of my demos will start now. I have a whole bunch of them, little small bits, but. Um, so in here, I hope, yeah, this is probably visible all the way in the back, right? Is it good? Yeah, all right. Okay, so I have a little project here. It's also on GitHub, so I'll give you the link at the end of the talk, but know for now that we have a person, right? This is a Pojo. Has some uh, Jackson annotations on it. The nice to string. Then we have a person repository, which is a, uh, a reactive repository. I could have actually used uh, reactive data for this, right? Spring, spring, uh, spring data reactive for this effort. Uh, however, I decided to focus only on the functional programming, on the functional web framework. So instead, I created a little dummy in-memory implementation of this. But you can imagine that this same contract can easily be implemented by any kind of reactive data store, be it MongoDB or be any kind of other choice that you have there, right? These are all uh, reactive repository signatures. So first off, getting a person given a particular ID um, that will return a mono, so one zero or one instance of a person class, right? All people will return a flux, so that's a stream of, well, zero or more um, persons in this class. And then finally we have a safe person which takes a mono of a person, right? So this will probably come out of the request somehow, right? Probably with some sort of HTTP post method. Um, saving it, and then we have a mono void return type, which is a bit of a strange, might require a little bit of explanation. Uh, basically, that indicates uh, a sort of a completion signal. <clears throat> so when you save a person, obviously the, that result will not be saved right away, it will take some time, and that mono void it basically is a, is a flag or an indicator when the save operation is completed. So we can use that as a, you can also compare it in a way to something like a future or something, right? Just saying, okay, there's not gonna be any elements in that stream, but there's gonna be a completion signal at least. And that's basically what that, uh, what that mono void uh, used. You'll see if you look in the Spring Reactive code base, or the Spring Webflux code base, uh, you'll see a heck of a lot of mono voids being used all over the place. Right, so that's all my backend infrastructure, nothing fancy so far. Here, we actually have a person handler, but I'm gonna close this for now, and I'm just gonna start a new one. So let's close all this. Public void for a handler function. Um, It's basically a function of a request. Given a request, you can do something with it, right? You have to return a response. So what, do we, what can we do, for instance? Well, we can say the very simple example, say, OK, server response. And then we say, OK, so we want to return a 200 OK status code and then build. Very simple example, right? This would be, this is a perfectly fine example of a handler function, right? And then IntelliJ gives me some suggestions saying, well, you could replace that with an expression so you don't need to return anymore. These are basically the same. Um, so yeah, you can, basically what I'm trying to say here is you can have write them inline, right? Like any Lambda. However, if you do that, you'll end up with a lot of inline function one against after the other. Um, it's typically a better idea to try to combine them somehow, right? Like you do in a typical controller class to put related handler functions next to each other in a class. Um, and you can easily do that with a method reference. So rather than writing handler functions this way, you can actually also write them as a method, right? So we can say, I can write a method that returns a server response. Oh, response. Call it uh, do it. Given a server request, and then I can say, like so, right? 
This is also a handler function. And why is it? Well, I can easily show you. I can just say, um, go. I'm not so sure if everybody is aware of this notation, but this is basically a new feature in Java 8 as well called method references. You can reference a method that has the particular uh, functional signature that you're looking for. Um, and that's quite nice for grouping methods together. So, so far, nothing exciting, right? We have a very simple do it member here. Let's take a look, however, at a bit more exciting stuff. So let's get rid of this. We don't need this anymore. Let's take a look at this, right? So my person handler, which if you compare it to, um, once again, comparing it to, to Spring MVC annotation style, this is sort of a request mapping method, right? Your, your controller method. Um, this particular one is wired up with a repository, which I showed you earlier, right? We have a dummy implementation of that. And then I basically say, give me all people. And then I return a response for that. I say, OK, I want to have a 200 OK status with a particular content type, JSON. And then I'll say, um, Pass on the body, right, the people that I just got from the repository, and then pass on the person. So it's vital to know that this flux is a stream, right? It's not, at this point, it's not like a list. You don't have all the results ready. This is just, you know that something is coming at some point, data is coming, and that data will be of uh, a flux of people. Right? So that's one thing we can do. This is another thing we can do, as in a, in a request, right, where we can say, okay, take something from requests. So this will typically be mapped somehow. We'll take a look at that later. But this will be mapped to a HTTP post method, where we have some data being posted, and we turn the request data into a mono in this type of person class. Right? We can also say turn it into a flux. And there's a whole pluggable mechanism as well uh, available if you want to override this and, and provide your own customer. So we can say turn the request data, the bytes that are in the, in the, in the in the request data, turn those into a uh, person in this case, and then next step is save that in the repository. And you'll see, right, so here we have save person. And once again, we have the mono void, so we use that actually here as our argument for our builder. So this response will be built when the save, com save operation is completed. You don't have to do it this way. You could say return OK before it's even saved. But this way, we know for sure that if the response is being provided, then the, the thing has been saved. Any questions so far? I do want to, if you have any questions, hard to follow, then please raise your hand. Sorry. Yes, I will. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Open this one. Right? Okay. Last up is a bit more complex, complicated one, where we want to get a single person. Now, it's actually not that hard, right? Let's ignore this for a moment. Um, first, what we do here is we say, OK, I know that in my request, there's a path variable with a particular param parameter ID. So you can already see that this is going to be uh, some sort of uh, slash persons, and then some sort of ID is taken from our request variable, right? Um, ignore this line for a moment. We'll talk about it later. Then I'm going to say, OK, um, take that person, that single person that you find, create a content type, and create a body from it, an object. Similar to what we do here, right? Except now that we have a single instance instead of a whole flux, a whole, a whole flux of them. Um, it gets a bit more tricky if you want to have something that returns a 404, right? So ideally, if you're doing a request for slash a particular resource and we can't find that particular person in our repository, we want to return a 404 to the client saying, well, this, is, this particular person is not available. And that's what we do in the other methods. What we do here is we create an, an alternative response, OK, saying not found. So this will be a 404 status code. And then we do a little bit of trickery. We try to get the person from the repository. Normally, right, in a non-reactive world, we would just say, if person is null, 
return for for otherwise uh, return the person, right? However, this is, once again, these are all streams. We cannot, we cannot inspect the person model. We cannot say, well, the only thing we can do is this. We can say, okay, person is person mono dot block. And that word should already warn, give you a lot of warnings, <laughs> all kinds of red lights that you don't, you don't want this in any kind of reactive asynchronous uh, scalable code, right? You're blocking at this point. You're waiting until the, until the person becomes available. So you're holding up the thread at this point. So no block. Block, bad. Um, what we do instead is to say, OK, let's inspect that mono, map it to this particular response if, it's, if a person becomes available, right? because then we are in a flat map operation. We bring provided a person. Otherwise, and this is basically functionality that's in, in, uh, in, uh, in Reactor, otherwise, just return not found. Right? So this will say, OK, I'm getting a person. Let's see if there's an element in that stream. If it is, then show that element as JSON. Otherwise, give a, a for full response. Clear? I hope so. All right, so that's handlers, right? And only so far, we've only been dealing with code that actually deals with the request and creates a response. We have not really been mapping anything. We have not really been <coughs> uh, routing to it. And that's because there's a separate part for that. For that part, we have a particular interface called router function. Um, router function <coughs> uh, also takes, yeah, I'm pointing at this thing. That's not very <laughs> useful for you guys. I should point there. Um, router function takes a request as well. And then it returns a mono app handler function. So if you know your Spring MVC, you'll see that, uh, or Spring in general, you'll see that this is very similar to the handler mapping contract, right? Handler mapping is an internal Spring type that we have, which you don't really know, have to know about, but it's similar, right? So this, what this does, say, OK, given this particular request, give me, notif let me know if there is a handler function, a function that that can handle it. If there isn't, right, it's a mono, so the result can be either 0 or 1. Uh, if there is, then I'll use it to handle this function. If there isn't, then I might look for the next option. Right? <clears throat> um, this is the way you typically create these router functions. I'll get to a demo in a minute, but I wanted to show you this first. Um, <clears throat> we say, you can create a router function given a particular predicate and a particular handler function. And the implementation is not that important. Nesting, I'll talk about in a minute, but let's first take a look at this. So this request predicate, what does that mean? Where does that come from? Well, that's another function, a function called request predicate. And that function basically just test whether a particular property is true on the request. We provide a whole bunch of request ped predicates by default, but this is a functional interface. You can and you should probably write your own, right? You, these are, you, probably by composing with others, right? You don't have to write your own predicates from scratch. But for instance, let's say that you want to um, um, well, I'll give examples in a minute. Um, comma predicates are, you can access the path, right? Say if you can access the method, the HTTP method, saying is it a HTTP get, is it an HTTP post? You can combine them, right? Saying, okay, it, it's a get, HTTP get combined with this particular path, combined with this particular content type. So all kinds of flexibility that is simply not available uh, in the annotation-based model, right? Annotation-based model is rather limited in that sense. You cannot express in annotation-based model, you cannot express route all methods that, have a that don't have this particular content type, route that to this method. That's impossible. You might argue whether that's useful or not, right? but it's, it's definitely not possible. So I think it's once again best if I just show you rather than tell you. Oops, don't go too far. So I have my handler function here. Let's, let's get rid of that. Don't need that. I instead, I'm going to the server. So 
Got rid of this. Got rid of this. Got rid of this. Let's get rid of this as well for now. So, I don't know. Once again, I can type this any way I want. Right? If it's once again, it's a function that takes a request and re should return a mono. So I can say, well, if request dot, um, I don't know, path, I guess, equals foo, then return a mono of just a particular handler function, right? This would be the, the, the silly way of doing it. Like I showed you earlier, you can actually uh, use some shortcuts that we provide when you're dealing with predicates, right? You could say, uh, let's get the, so the handler. Person handler, oops, repository. Okay, repository. So now I could say uh, handler. Um, I don't know, these people. Else return mono to empty. No. This would be a very basic way of routing your own, writing your own router functions. This is not the way you typically do it, but I just wanted to show you how it works internally so you can understand better, I hope. So we'll basically do a little testing. If the path, if this particular thing, then return this uh, uh, list people handler function, right? Otherwise, don't return anything. And that's obviously a very common pattern, so common that we do it by default. But. as I showed in the slides, this is not what you do typically. What you do typically is use predicates. So you can say dot get, uh, let's just start simple. Let's say path This is equivalent to what I just had on the screen, right? <coughs> We're testing on a particular pattern, slash foo, and then if that particular pattern applies, then return this particular handler method, right? But we can compose on that. And that's the nice part. We can actually say, make this a thing, make this a predicate. And predicate is predicate. And request get. Uh, let's make it a bit more clear. So now we are doing it a bit more interesting. We're saying, okay, create a predicate for this particular path that matches this uh, pattern. And then we say, well, combine that predicate with another predicate. Right. Composing, that's a very functional thing to do. Composing smaller bits into bigger bits, uh, which you can use, it gives you a lot of flexibility. I could also say, um, Now, it gets a bit silly, but still works, right? We have a predicate that matches this particular path. Uh, we combine it with, with foo, so now it will match against HTTP get for pattern foo, and then we say, well, actually, I want the complete opposite thing, right? I want to match all requests which do not fulfill these two patterns, right? And once again, you can combine it anyway. We could do also do an or here, 
Right? So you have a complete access to all kinds of logical uh, prepositions here. Now, this is once again a bit silly, so let's show you the real, uh, the way we really do it. Um, here we go, router function. So I, once again, I create a, a repository, I create a handler, and then I create a couple of um, request predicates here. Here's one, I say, okay, anytime you see a handler, anytime you get this particular pattern, return get person. If the method is get, return this people. If the, if the method is containing a post and it's posting JSON, then route that to the create person uh, method. And now it also gets interesting before, before we can nest things, right? This routing, uh, functions. there we go. The route method that we've been using so far takes a predicate and then a handler function to point to. The nest method takes a predicate and then actually takes a new router function. So you're router, routing to other routers, basically, having an extra step of definition. And here, you can see how we use this. You, can say, you see here, we nest this path. So all the, the router functions are provided here as this parameter is nested with this particular path. So all routers, all router functions in this nesting, in this nesting, have this particular path applied to it. And here we do the same thing. We nest it with an accept JSON, which means that these, this route and this route both have this applied to it and this applied to it. Does that make sense? So it's, you're very easily uh, only have to define. You can compare this in a way, I guess, to uh, top level on a type level uh, get mapping, for instance, or type level request mapping. You can put a request mapping on the class level rather than a method uh, in, an annot in the annotation based programming model. And then that predicate will apply to all the methods contained. Same thing applies here. We're nesting it. We're saying every router that we define follows, following this particular predicate person has these particular things applied to it. So both. Um, get person and list people are nested within application JSON. And then we have another one where we say, well, this is a post, so we don't really care about if the accept type is JSON or not, because we're not returning any type. We're saying, well, for this particular one, we say, if something is posted to slash person and the content type of that post data is JSON, then we create a person. As you'll see, you'll notice is that these things, you'll end up with a lot of curly braces, right? And tomorrow, Sebastian will talk, a lot, talk about this similar programming model, the same programming model, but then in Kotlin, and you'll deal, be dealing, seeing a lot less braces in there. But here, I don't know any Kotlin. I'm too old for that. Um, I only know Java. Um, so you're, you have to have, you have to deal, unfortunately, with these braces. It doesn't mean that you cannot make it readable. You can say, these are basically my um, JSON providers, right? Both of these routes provide JSON. This, I think, makes it a lot more readable as well, right? So now I have, if the, every, all things match person, if they provide JSON, then they are listed here. If they don't, then they're listed here. But the important part is, I think, that these are components that you can play with, right? These are, you can combine them, you can name them anything you want, and you can uh, write the functional code any way you want to. Ooh, running a bit out of time here, so maybe I have to hurry. Any questions about router functions? There's one there. I have a little bit more to talk about, so maybe okay. hopefully I keep it quiet. Just a very short one. Uh, sorry. Um, 
Where is the actual JSON serialization? Because we have the accept here, but this is about routing, and in the handler, you only return the flux of right. person models. Yeah. Basically, what happens behind the scenes is very comparable to at response body. Uh, if you use at response body with the at controller, with a yeah, in a controller model, right? So we take this flux, we use the same underlying technical components to convert this person or stream of people into JSON, and uh, yeah, exactly the same te technology is used underneath that is used for Spring uh, Spring MVC. If you remind, remember that picture I showed you earlier. That's where that fits in, basically. Spring Web Reactive, that's where that fits in. All right, I think I'll move on. A bit more slides to go through, and I have five more minutes. Filters, I think I don't have time to talk about today, which is unfortunate, because they can really do a lot of cool stuff. Um, but if you remember in my introduction, I talked about fu functions taking other functions and then uh, or taking the result of other functions, manipulating that, returning a new uh, element, as a, et cetera, et cetera, having a whole chain. That's basically what this function, handler filter function, is all about. This allows you uh, to, well, did this, and then this handler filter function basically allows you, for instance, to uh, inspect, right? Imagine, once again, you have that flux of people. But with a filter, you could do things like, let's inspect each and every element in that list, see if the, the currently logged in user has access to that, is allowed to see that person. If not, remove it from a flux, right? So you're filtering, basically. And these filters can be applied to not just a single handler method, but a whole range of them. You can apply them at the top level, and then every router function that falls underneath, follows underneath, will be applied this filter upon. I'm going to skip the demo for that um, because I only have a couple of minutes left. But for now, I want to talk a little bit, final part, about running this thing, right? So how do you run this? Basically, you have two options. You can run it in Spring Boot. And as it says here, what you can do is configure router functions as beans in a configuration class. And Spring Boot will basically pick those up um, well, what I say here is not exactly true yet because I haven't committed it yet, but next, as of next week, you'll be able to do that. You'll be able to write them as beans and it will just be picked up and just like any kind of controller. Um, however, there's an alternative, well, and that's something I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes, is that you can actually do it yourself, right? Without having any kind of application context in, uh, uh, involved at all converted your particular router function into a HTTP handler, which is a low-level contract we have, sort of comparable to Servlet in a way. Um, and then you can run that on Reactor Netty, Tomcat, Servlet, 3.1 or higher, and Undertow. Um, I think especially this is something very interesting that we offer, I think the only ones that we do uh, offer and then the screen with Offer server support because in server 3.1, you can actually do asynchronous uh, um, programming quite well. We spent a lot of time making sure that our server support was there. So you can actually switch between more reactive uh, approaches like Netty, but also something like Tomcat and Undertow. So that's the final part I'm going to show today, I hope. Well, I guess my laptop decided to give it a... Hmm. <laughs> oh, well. I guess I have time for questions after all. <laughs> I'm not going to be bothered with this because it, I can't get it to work. So, questions then, 10 minutes. Is there any question? Yes, there's a question here. Wait for the guy with the microphone. Sorry, maybe I didn't got the point, but when you showed the example before where you uh, response okay to the build because you wanted to wait, the person was saved in the database. Yes. You explained that this will block and return the 200 just after the database. The, the data. Yeah. 
Instead, in the other cases, get all peoples, the response OK was not calling build method. What does it mean? Returns the OK immediately, 200, and then the list of peoples? How? I think it, both times I used build, but once I think um, I can't show you now because my laptop decided to quit, but I'm pretty sure that I used build in both methods. So build just builds the response, right? And as I said, the response itself is immutable, right? There's no way of changing that. So any kind of time you want to build a server response, you have to end the whole chain with build. I do understand your question now. Basically, we did a little trick. If you have a body, then you don't have to call build because we know that the body is the last thing, the last chain of that method call. Uh, the, body is basic, the body call is basically the same as the build call. It doesn't wait. No, it's just, it doesn't wait at all. It just builds the response with the flux not even there yet. So I, the, the response will just say contain a flux saying, at some point, I'll get some data. And then we give that to the reactive runtime, and that will, well, not wait, it'll just say, OK, as soon as an element comes in, then I'll write it out as JSON, and then another element comes in, I'll write it out, and then at the end, I'll, I'll commit the whole response as a whole. But uh, yeah, there's no blocking involved at all, unless you do it by hand. Any other questions? There's one over there. Do you see him? <laughs> okay. Uh, this, in the example, with not found, that not found response is built every time, no matter if the uh, scene was found or not. Isn't there a way to use also method reference so it's more effective? And then, if the person is there, the not found response isn't actually built. I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you repeat? Uh, so the not found response in the example, yeah, it's built every time. So even yes. if the actual oh, response yes. will be. I see. So you basically want to know, is it possible for me to only build the not found response if it actually isn't found? Yes. yes. Uh, the reason I put it on a separate line is for readability. I could have just inlined that, and it wouldn't be uh, invoked at all. Probably I might have to use a provider then in order, instead of a, yeah, I probably had to change a little bit of code, but yes, it's definitely possible. Yeah, okay. for sure. <laughs> the only reason, once again, I did it was readability, as you can know. Um, this is, once again, the code, if you want to take another look at it, it's on my uh, GitHub account. I can't provide a link now anymore, but basically my GitHub name is Poutsma, that's my last name. So if you look there, you'll see web function sample, I believe it's called. Uh, so you can take another look there. One more question. We have time for one more question. Oh, there's one, yes. This looks really nice. I have a question regarding testing. Yeah. Uh, do you already include any testing support? Yes, in this? we do. We have uh, in new in Spring 5, I didn't even talk about that. Yeah. We have in Spring 5, uh, I always forget the name. Is it web test client or is it test web client? <laughs> web, web test client. So web test client is a very similar to the client we have uh, in general, right? So we have a new web client, as you saw in the keynote. Um, web test client sort of has the same interface, but can actually you can bind to controllers, you can bind to an application context, or you can bound to bind to router functions. So you can just bind your router functions, and then you can test those without starting up a whole server. The one thing that's interesting that I wasn't able to show you, unfortunately, is that because this whole approach so far doesn't use an application context, it starts up within milliseconds, basically. There's no, yeah, and that's very unfortunate that I can't show you that, but it does sort of start up very quickly because there's no reaction. There's only whatever is compiled is basically is executed. I think that's all we have time for today. So um, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be around. You can always ask me. Thank you. <laughs>